Hey guys, this is Pill Eater. Today is April 27th, 2022. I'm actually here with my co-host Cartrell Payne. And today we have on is Mickey Royal. Hi, Royal. How you doing? Great. So, um, Cartrell, you were telling me about Mickey, but uh, kind of don't know anything about Mickey. So I guess uh, if Mickey wants to take the floor here and talk about himself and what's he about, um, I'm, I'm curious too. So, uh, would you like me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Well, that would be a very long conversation. Uh, I'm the best-selling author of the book, The Pimp Game Instructional Guide. I've been, I've led quite the life, if you want to even talk about it. I mean, I'm a former pimp, a former pornographer, former mob enforcer, former drug dealer, uh, did my little stint as a gangbanger as a youth. So, and now I write books. It's like that kind know. of in the tradition of like Iceberg Slim and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Now I am, yeah. But in the beginning, no, I led quite a different life than Iceberg Slim. Mm. Yeah, I'm, right now I'm in San Francisco. So I, I assume LA is a very different territory over there. Well, I live in Mexico now, but uh, I grew up in Inglewood, primarily that's inside of Los Angeles County. Lived in, L you know, LA is Inglewood. I mean, Inglewood is in LA, but it's smaller, it's inside, but specifically Inglewood. When I say that, guys on the street know what that means. I mean, yeah. Cartrell, did you want to ask Mickey, Mickey something? Oh yeah, what I was going to ask was like, okay, since you live such a long life, I'll just start it off with this answer. I mean, this question, like, what was it like growing up? Like, what made you want to get involved, you know, in a criminal organizations as a young man? Well, uh, you know, I'm 50 years old now, and I've been a career criminal since age 13. But it's, it was a slow ascend or descend, depending on which uh, field of the spectrum, end of the spectrum you want to look at it. But it was all around me. I mean, it was in Inglewood. It was during the crack time. Before crack, everything was okay. I mean, I could compare it to almost a Cosby show type of upbringing. I was pre, excuse me for just a second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, that was on um, 1985 to 1980. That, that changed everything. And it's not so much you wanting to. I said in previous interview, I think what started me into the love of it was uh, break dancing. I really got into break dancing pop locking when I was 12 years old. But what it did was it allowed me to stay out late at night. Now, while I was out late at night, I saw other things that attracted me. It was just the energy. And growing up in Inglewood, and especially when the crack era came you either were a predator or you were prey and i don't do prey very well and it just i just took to it like a fish to water and i hate to sound cliche like the movies but everyone around me was involved in some kind of way you know and it was just the thing we all did it was it's a part of la culture it goes back long before i was born i mean yeah because i think like the oldest gang in la was started in like 1910 like that's even before like the you know what they were doing in Chicago with the Italian mob outfit, like that's what really old. Yeah, that's uh the Latino gangs. Uh, I know White Fence is old. There's a couple of other ones that's old that come from the turn of the century, and people don't understand. It's um it's family oriented. What I mean is you have three, four generations in the in the set and things like that. So when when I say Inglewood is primarily an all blood city, you have crip pockets in there. You know, you have 10 Deuce Raymond, that's 102nd Street. You have IVCs, Watergate Crip, I think that's where DJ Koo is from. And uh, that's it. Other than that, from both sides is different blood gangs. And at that time, all blood gangs got along. So it's just, that was just Inglewood. That was just Inglewood. That's where it was. And when you went outside to play, these were the kids. I mean, you weren't so much in a gang when you were 10 or 11, but your friends' older brothers were, and it was perfectly normal. They didn't bother you. 
if anyone bothered you, they protected you because you're from that neighborhood. So you didn't see them as the bad guys. You know, I used to see uh, any crip as, as like non-human when I was 10, 11, 12. But those were the guys who tried to hurt me or take my bike, whatever. But I knew if I made it back close enough to home, they would turn around. So you, it's kind of a, a slow, subtle, subconscious indoctrination. You know, I was shot at 14 for the first time. I was already full fledged at 13. I was already working. I, I had pictures on my Facebook and everything. I was already, already selling rocks and fully involved by the age of 13. I was in seventh grade. So it, it starts early, you know. Was there any particular uh, individual or celebrity you met at that young age who is still alive today or has passed away? What do you mean, um, that's in the life? Yeah, like somebody you knew that maybe is gone because of drugs or died or in jail. Oh God, that's way too many people to mention. Uh, alive today, I remember I was basically uh, on and off living with microconception when I was like, how old was I, 15? Well, however old you are in the 10th grade. Was I in the 10th? Yeah, I was in the 10th grade then. And uh, I was on and off living with him. Barefoot Pookie was there. That was out in Carson on the street called Sandpoint. Uh, still alive. It's, it's just too many names. I mean, you're talking about 37 years of my life. I mean, that's, that's you know, 30, that, that, that's too many names to name. But he's the biggest one I know that's still alive, still making big money. But there's quite a few of them. The ones that are still alive, they're either one or two ways. They're either very, very, very broke, or they're very, very rich right now. And it's more broke ones than the rich ones. As far as penitentiary, yeah, you, I mean, you go in and out. I've been in and out half my life. I assume that the rich ones just got lucky. This, it just happened for them or? They got, the ones that still have their money, they diversified early. The earlier you diversify, the, the longer, those are the ones. They went off into the music business, uh, real estate. Uh, several of them went into trucking, bought like 20, 30 trucks. They got out. Those were the older ones, not the ones that came up in my era at my age. They're doing it now. But the ones that were like in their late 20s at the time when I was 13, 14, that are, have money now, they're involved in those kind of things. Some, I know one, he has like an anti gang and drug thing going on and the program of programs or whatever, but the ones that got the real, real money that I know of, that's either real estate trucking or the entertainment field, music business. Several of them went into the music business. Is one being dishonest if they are a part of an anti-gang association or is it more something positive to have the gang relation? Because there's a lot that associate gang life and it's good, but I guess being in a gang and then being anti-gang, it seems kind of almost like a self-shame kind of thing. Some of them are sincere. I'm not going to call out any names. Anybody who knows LA, we know who we're talking about, but some of them are really sincere. You do a lot of things in the early gang life. That's why they call it <coughs> PTSD. People concentrate on the uh, traumatic word, the T word. No, the, the word you need to concentrate on is post because you don't feel it until after the fact. When my uncle was in Vietnam and just slaughtering people wholesale, he didn't think about it. He didn't have PTSD, he was doing a job. It was only like eight years after he came home that the nightmares start, that the drinking start. Did the uh, having to go to these meetings, did the crying spells and stuff start? See, it's post, you know, it, it, it comes afterwards. So a lot of them, several of them are very sincere about the. I mean, those stories you read, those are real people. Those are not just numbers. When they say, oh, four were killed. Yeah, it was actual teenagers who ran in that house, tied people up and shot them execution style. And it wasn't their first time because they did it with such uh, precision. You know, they've done this over and over and over again. Well, that's fine when you're 13, 14, 15. You just go home and eat some cereal and you laugh about it. But when you have start getting older and you have children that you want to protect and they can't ride their bikes in the same neighborhood that you help turn into this, some people, they really get that guilt and they really get that shame and their programs are legit. You have other ones who have one foot in the gang, one foot in the program, and it's just a con to get money out of the government so they can flip some bricks. But like, but more of them, most of them are sincere. They really feel, when they get 50, 55, uh, 40, 45, you really start to feel differently. 
you know, that, that friend that died next to you when you were uh, 14, 15, and then you see like his sister go on and get married and have children and her children have children. You're like, you know, Anthony's not coming back. You know, when I was shot at 14 for the first time, Anthony was shot. He got shot in the thigh, I got shot in the chest. I survived, he didn't. Well, his bullet ricochet ended up in his body somewhere. Mine went straight in and stuck there. So that's just how the mob flops. But at the age of 50, I realized Anthony's been dead for 36 years. You know, you, you look back on it then. So yeah, some, is it oxymoronish? Yes, hypocritical, I wouldn't say so. That's, that's a heavy word, but uh, it is an oxymoron because some can't handle having one foot in and one foot out. Some can't, it's just so alluring that one, when you have one foot, okay, I, I, you have one foot in the gangs, you have one foot with gang prevention trying to pull them over, sometimes they suck you back across. And I've seen that happen recently. Oh, oh yeah, Mr. Um, Royal, like, um, oh yeah, what I wanted to ask was, since you are, you know, a gangbanger, you were an enforce, enforcer for the mob, how realistic are shows like The Wire or The Sopranos? The Sopranos, it's a slight exaggeration, but it's realistic because I've sat in those rooms. I could never be one of them. I wasn't trying to be one of them, but I, you can look on my page. I left uh, my main man, my broker, he was like an uncle to me. Uh, he just passed away last year from COVID. I think he was in his late seventies and uh, he was out of New York. And I don't want to get into too much who he is, but I, I put his picture up there and the picture of us together. It's on my Facebook, you have to scroll down. And um, funny you should mention The Sopranos. I think his cousin was a high ranking member of the, the Cavalcanti family. And uh, that was the, that's the actual real Soprano. I think he's in prison on a, a murder charge right now. But uh, I can't talk about that, but The Wire, that was really realistic. That, that reminded me of junior high school. You know, I, I never wanted to be a drug kingpin. Drugs weren't really my thing. I just did it because it was right there. You know, enforcing, I started doing early. Uh, I didn't work for the Italians until I was in my late 20s. And I was dealing with Russians in my mid 20s. But, you know, in LA, you're going to run into a lot of different cultures. I, I ran into, I was dealing with the Italians for a small part when I was in the trucking business. I had diversified. But when it got major, that was in the porn business. I mean, you can Google names that I put up there uh, that I'm in the pictures with. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I saw a lot of, not so much similarities, but almost hand in hand. Almost, almost hand in hand. The Sopranos was kind of an exaggeration, but again, that's back east. The, the guys I dealt with were on the West Coast. They were from New York, but they weren't in New York. Because when you're not on your home territory, even though they have a faction out there, and LA does have a small crime family, the Milano crime family, which is really a bastardized crime family made up of the other 24 crime families around the Italians around the United States. So you have Columbos in there, you have Lucchese's in there, things like that, or come from that lineage. They can't be as, and forgive my way of saying this, they can't be as Italian as they can freely in New York. In LA, they just look like a bunch of old white men going to play golf. But every once in a while, in the meetings, in the office, because I've dealt with the same ones, they come, some will come in with the slick back hair, the leather coats. And keep in mind, the, yo the youngest one at the time was in his mid 50s. <clears throat> so these are older men. But they're all from New York, they got heavy accents. You know, I never heard the word mafia but one time. And that was uh, kind of sarcasm. Um, Vinny used to say, and I, I assume Vinny's dead now because he was 85 at the time, in great shape. So if he's still alive, he's good Lord. But he, he, he would say Cosa Nostra a lot, or our thing. When it, when it came up, I was in the room, you know, and we'd be talking sometime, and that's what he mentioned. He would say OC a lot, which means organized crime, in reference to like the Justice Department, but you don't. You know, it, I never heard him say, uh, well, I did hear a couple of them say, forget about it. But 
my boss used to say, uh, what are you going to do? You know, what do you want from me? He would say that we would have these on Saturday, we would have personal conversations. It wouldn't be business. And we would talk about politics, religion, race relations in America. We'd be very blunt and honest. And then it would get real quiet. He'd go, and he would shrug his shoulders and go, what are you going to do? Let's go eat. And then we, we'd go eat. We ate like three times within five hours. It was always soup. You know, stuff like that, something light, but you know, things like that. But yeah, the surprise and the wire, man, the wire brought back some memories, even though it's on the East Coast. But that reminds me of my youth, youth, like from 13 to about 15, 16. Most of the movies you watch are just flat out lies. Uh, most of the interviews I've seen people on, especially from the pimp gang. They're just exaggeration and lies. I get it. You saw Willie Dynamite. You saw the Mac. You're perfect Im imitation. But no, the ones who really did it, did it. You know, so 30 seconds of walking in the room, you know. But most of them are, are just exaggerations. Kind of remind me of rappers without beats. It's kind of like, um, I always used to think there was that one Italian guy, Michael, uh, last name's kind of forgetting, but he was on the Mike Tyson podcast and his whole career is talking about being a part of the Italian mafia, but you have to question how much of, you know, was it legitimate he was in there, you know, and it seems like once you make a career out of talking hypothetical crime or in subculture, it's like, there's a facade to it. We don't know, but. Well, it's, it's, it's always, see, I don't, I think you, if you're talking about Michael Franzi's from a uh, Colombo family, yeah, he was the real deal. Uh, his father, Sonny Franzese, was a uh, big time in the Colombo family. Happened to be the same one that uh, my associates were, but they were on the West Coast. One Milano family, but his father was a Lucchese family uh, captain and eventually underboss, the ones from Goodfellas. Mm -hmm. That was that And uh, if I ever met Michael Franzese, I could write down a few names and he could verify those names because they are who they say they are. I mean, nobody was acting. Uh, Sammy the Bull, we know he is who he says he is. <clears throat> but there is a Hollywood element to it. And Hollywood is very, very alluring. You know, in the West Coast, we have celebrity gangsters. I became one. And the Justice Department follows. You know, I have Homeland Security stories. I have uh, FBI RICO trial stories, you know. I mean, if your name is in people's mouths, believe your file is on someone's desk. And that's pretty much the order. So you try to stay anonymous and you try to stay um, out of the way. I don't take many pictures. That's why I recycle the same. I take them a lot now. I've taken more pictures in the past, I would say, 10 years than I have in my entire life. You know, but you, you stayed off of pictures and things like that. But LA has this allure about the West Coast period and Hollywood being a celebrity gangster, like the Mickey Cohens or the Freeway Ricky Rosses. And, once you become a celebrity gangster, you just become a Justice Department target. I've been in several times, you know, knock on wood, I'm still here and I'm out, but. It feels you know. like uh, in recent times, one of the big stories was that uh, Takashi 6 9 ratted out on his entire crew back in New York and so much he now has a hit on him if they ever get to him. And it makes you think about some of the ex-gangsters who will, you know, snitch or rat on their fellow crew just so they can get a little fame or not have a criminal record. And have you experienced that where there's ratting a lot now in 2022? Well, I see that that's the norm, you know. I see that that's the norm. I mean, the rapper gangsters, I don't consider gangsters at all. And you have two different types. You have gangsters with an E-R-S and you have gangsters with an A that ends with an A. Most of them are the ones that end with A. Now, their murders are real. Those are real people going into the real ground and real family members screaming. But the way they operate, they don't operate as a gang. They operate as like, remember that movie Gremlins after they fed the gremlin after dark and how they all were just running through town wreaking havoc? Those are not the men that I dealt with from the age of 15, 16 on. They were always organized, whether they were Black, Russians, Italians, uh, Latinos, not really in LA, but Tijuana a lot. You know, I've been arrested. I did 17 days in a Tijuana jail in my 20s. That's another story. I was smuggling back and forth. Uh, I've done pretty much everything as far as crime is concerned. I, I, I looked at it as an actual career. 
you know, but the ratting came about with the RICO and everything. You know, it's an old saying in the federal prison, why do 10 when you can tell on a friend, you know? <laughs> so, and that's what I loved about the pimp game because I can honestly tell you, the only time I've ever been ratted on in the pimp game by one of those women was a one by a woman I never actually met face to face. She made up stories. And then when it started to unravel, the case fell apart. But it was investigated. I was questioned. I was subpoenaed and all of this. And she has schizophrenia, but a lot of the women in the life, they have some kind of mental illness. And her stories got so bizarre. And I could prove that I can't be in two places at one time and it just fell apart. But any woman that ever worked for me, never. Anybody that ever did business with me, never. If so, I'd be locked up now. Um, yeah, um, like, oh, like, are the stories of getting turned out in LA true? Like, you know, they say these stories of women coming from places like Mississippi and Nebraska, and they're probably rednecks or they come from the projects and they come to like LA to, to become a star, but it doesn't work out. I can only talk about what I've seen and personally experienced. Anything else I would have to get from a reliable source or television. I don't use reliable sources. I don't use television. And if I use reliable source, I'll say you didn't hear this from me. Now, when you talk to me, know that I've either done this or experienced this. Yes, that's true. But more so, the women who come from out of town, they're already turned out. They've already been working where they are, what I see, and they come in to make some of that Hollywood money. When they come in from Chicago, when they come in from Detroit, they're already seasoned. They come in and they hit the, the ground ready to rock and roll. And the ones that come in from out of town, see it's a stereotype going on that most of the women are in desperate situations and they just got kicked out by their boyfriend. Has that happened in my life? Yeah, a lot in my twenties, but primarily, no, that's, that's, that's not true. Most of them are in the life because they want to they wanna do it. Quite frankly, a lot of these women had more money than I did came from much better backgrounds than I did. It was exciting to them. It's the allure of it that I speak of all the time. It's really their choice. Most of the time, it's really their choice. But a lot of, I do know stories. God, I got so many stories because I did this for, yeah, like 30 years, like all of my life is what I know. I do know so because I used to operate primarily in Hollywood and in the Valley and LA, everywhere, but Hollywood was my major money and my base. Uh, they do come from Hollywood and they, a lot of them don't make it. Most of them don't make it. They go, do go to Hollywood to make it and they end up in the Hollywood life. Hollywood in the daytime is not Hollywood at nighttime. You know, Hollywood at nighttime reminds you of the movie Deep Cover, you know, because I've lived on those streets. I've had condos and stuff on those streets. I've had employees on those streets, those very streets that they shot in. I know that liquor store they were standing in front of. I can, I can, it's not too far from the wild card gym where uh, Freddie Roach's wild card gym is. Yeah, so when you, yeah, when you mentioned that, I'm reminded of like when they shot those movies in the hood in the 90s and the early 2000s. Like they, um, they shot uh, Boys in the Hood and uh, Menace to Society, I think, in the Jordan Downs, I'm not sure. And they shot like Training Day in like the jungles. Training day, a lot of it was in the jungles. I saw them, I saw them when they, I was there when they were filming it. I didn't stick around. I was doing business. I was passing by and I could see the trailer set up and stuff. And I didn't get out and talk to anybody. You know, I was really doing what I was doing. Uh, Boys in the Hood was shot right most primarily on Crenshaw. That was rolling 60s or neighborhood crip area because I know where they are, you know. And some of it was in the jungles. The last shooting scene, it was at a place called Edaburger. And, uh, that's in the jungles. That's where the Crenshaw Baldwin Mall is. And that's the borderline, actually. There's quite a few sets that be up there, but it's primarily the Jays. But, you know, 60s go in there when they want to. Rolling 40s be mobbing through there when they want to. But it's primarily jungle. Yeah. And uh, Minister Society, that was supposed to be Grape Street, Grape Street Watts scripts, because they were in the Jordan Downs. Yeah. I, mean, oh, I think one of the filmmakers explained why they never like called the uh, characters in the movies Crip or never identified their gang is they didn't want, you know, like any trouble from that. So they just, you know, kind of they implied it, but they never said it. Yeah, it, that's really new. I mean, they've become celebrities now, but even back in the NWA days, NWA never wore blue. It was implied that they were Crips. They never said the word. Mm -hmm. I mean, people knew Easy e from the street. 
I knew of him from the street, but I'm not from Compton, but my brother dealt business in Compton and Watts, so I was with him a lot. But those weren't, you know, my people were on the west side. My brother, he dealt everywhere. I got to know a lot of people on the east side, but the east side people I dealt with in the business world early on, they were crips. So you get to know them as people. You know, they knew where I was from. I knew where they were from. We didn't really set trip on each other, but you get to know them. You get to know their families and realize they're just like you. So at that point, I started working with people of like mind. I didn't care if it was blood, no crap. But, yeah. You, oh, you know what also gets me about, like, California is, like, the, the amount of racism. I mean, you wouldn't think in a state so diverse there'd be, like, so many, like, you know, skinhead groups, you, you know, like in Orange County and, you know. Diversity, people think diversity is a good thing. Uh, diversity is not integration. People confuse the two. Diversity, because it's so much diversity in LA, every group is represented. I've never dealt with Ukrainians. I haven't seen any. And I had one Ukrainian woman. I used to call her Russian. And she would correct me and say, Ukrainian, I say, look, sweetheart, I'm selling you in Hollywood for $3,000 a pop. I said, no one knows where or what Ukraine is. You have to say that you're Russian because it's more exotic. I can sell that. Like if you're English, don't tell people you're English. I can't sell that. Say British. I can sell that. British raises your price. English does not. That's a muffin. I said, so I'm marketing you a certain way. But because of so many groups, you know, Armen Little Armenia, you have uh, Chinatown, you have Koreatown. They become almost like football teams. So it ends up with the reverse effect. That's why it's so racist because they all, think of, a, think of the NFL with a bunch of teams competing for the Super Bowl. So they're at each other's throats. No groups get along. You know, Armenians and Russians, they don't get along at all. I did great business with Russians, still have ties with them. Armenians, the first time they called me to a meeting, it ended with insults. The second time it ended with gunfire. I won both times, but I was invited both times. I felt more of an um, undertone of racism when I dealt with certain Armenians as opposed to with the Russians. I didn't feel any of that at all. Nothing whatsoever. I mean, we just did business. I felt that they were more military, you know, as opposed to like dealing with the Italian mafia. It's more like family oriented, like you see on the movies, the Russians were more, they just remind me of guys who used to be in the army, you know, but uh, LA, I've, I've, you know, done time in Tennessee. I have relatives there. I did uh, 11 months, 29 days there on a attempted murder charge. That's a long story, cause so little time. But again, I have a lot of key family members in Memphis and uh, they have connections and that was the best deal I could get. But uh, Mississippi, and I've experienced, I tell people all the time, I experienced more racism in California, especially from the police, than I ever have in the Deep South when I've gone and, and been there. And I've spent quite a bit of time in the South. I feel it more, the South is way more integrated than Los Angeles is. You can go down Crenshaw Boulevard and you'll go through Torrance, whereas the, how they say the deepest, darkest Africa, we always say the shallowest, whitest Torrance. You're still on Crenshaw. Then you go through Gardena, which is primarily Japanese. You have blacks there, uh, shotgun crips is in Gardena. You know, um, if you read my book, Along for the Rod, the club was in Gardena. They have quite a few uh, black strip clubs. You keep going down Crenshaw, you're still on the same street. It's a long street. You're talking about from 6th Street all the way to Path in the 200. So it's, it's very long, it goes through many cities. Then you go through South Central also. You go through Inglewood first, Hawthorne, Inglewood, South Central, you get to a point where all the signs turn to Korean. Just immediately when you cross through Jefferson, Adams, all of that, you go about a couple more blocks right before you get to Wilshire. That's where it dead ends. And uh, all the signs turn to Korean. You turn right, you're going into primarily uh, Chinatown. You go left, you're going into mostly Jewish area. Then you make a right on Vine, you're going into Hollywood, you got a mixture of everything. So they're like football teams navigating through there. And they're all competing. So it is diverse. It's, the, it's, it's a person from every country around the world who lives in Los Angeles, at least one person representing there. All the countries, I'm including Madagascar, you know. But uh, it's not integrated. It's a very segregated place, even though it's diverse. Yeah, oh, also, yeah, like, you know, a lot of the 
a lot of criminal organizations recruit people from the military. Like you look at the movie Dead Presidents, like you know ex Vietnam guys trying to pull off a bank robbery in Chicago. You know, I heard that was based on a true story, although I'm not a hundred percent sure. Well, I talked about in previous interviews. I robbed three banks in my life, uh, all in, as a teenager, all at age 17, same year. Uh, two on purpose, one by accident. The two I did on purpose, they were with ex Vietnam. Uh, ex-BLA, you know, um, ex-Vietnam veterans, ex-Black Liberation Army, what I call Islamic criminals, so to speak. And they didn't say rob, they used the term liberate. We're going to liberate funds, whatever. I was 17, but they were, they were considerably older. So at that part of the movie, I could relate. All that other stuff, I don't know what they talked about because at the time I still saw them as grownups I still saw myself as not quite an adult. So when grownups are talking, I separate myself. All I knew was my job. So I only did two with them. And they didn't like working with me because of my age. They just respected my seriousness, but I was still really not mature enough for what they were doing. I was capable, but no, because at that time it excited me. You know, I told my brother about it and they weren't really happy about things like that. I was too flamboyant and, you know, they were, if you saw them on the street, they have these old beat up Datsun cars and, and these beards and no. So that part I could relate to because of them. I would hear their stories about Vietnam, but you know, I was born in 72. It was, I think America pulled out in 75. So, you know, that was before my time, but. I could dig it though. I, I grew up with a lot of older men, hung around with a lot of them, heard a lot of stories, but I've never been in that type of uh, situation. So all I could do was listen when they talk. We're at the uh, end of the podcast. Time goes by so quick. But if there's any uh, new material that you have, Mickey, it's good to plug it in now. Or if anything you'd like to say about what's happening this year and your future projects? Future projects right now, I'm just retired. Uh, living in the beach of Mexico, writing books, you know, getting my Ernest Hemingway life on. But if you want to follow me, you can go to amazon.com, go onto the author's page, Mickey Royal, you'll see all the books I have up there. And you can just click the follow button because I have new projects coming out very soon. And that way you'll get a notification as to everything that comes out that's new. Cartrell, is there anything else you'd like to ask? Well, you can ask me anything about anything. Um, well, I'm always curious. Very quickly, what do you? What happened to most of your um the the prostitutes you know, or are they mostly in jail, or just married, or somewhere else? I'm always curious about that. Right now, I only know. Of one who actually did prison time, and that's because she hooked up with some knuckleheads and was transporting some stuff back and forth across the country. She got busted. Other than that, they're either still in a life, and I would say that's about 25%. Most of them have gone off and gotten married, and people do not know about their past lifestyle. Now, the ones who did pornography, they're about 50% still in a life. And the other ones actually have gone off and got married. I don't know too many single ones, put it that way. They either married and doing the, the what's her name, Claire Huxtable thing, and have squared up. Or I get calls periodically about opening after hours, stuff like that. And some I know in their 40s, even in their 50s, they're still at it. You know, they've, they've gone into this generation as far as the webcams, the OnlyFans. I mean, and yeah, you, you got a great point because I think Nina Hartley only just recently retired. Like she, she's been in it since like the early eighties, like dang. Yeah, she knows my boss, my former boss, Michael Esposito. That was gentleman's video. Uh, but that's a, I mean, he's, he goes back to the sixties in the game. So, you know, they all knew him and I met them all and they all came through there. You know, it's other stories, I guess we're out of time, but it's, it's so many stories, uh, you know, certain politicians, I don't want to, name their names, but when they want to be with porn stars and they come in from out of town, these women, they're not their real names and they're not listed in the phone book. And this is before Facebook and things like that. So what they would do is, and they didn't want a, a history like that. 
they pick up the box cover of the DVD and they call that number on the back. That number is my cell phone. So I tell people I have these inf this information because who do you think takes them there? Who do you think drops them off? What do you think we talk about on the way back? I said, you don't think we gossip around the water cooler? I am the water cooler. So we're talking about thousands of prostitutes within over a 20 year span, including porn stars with stories every day. And sometimes in books, I have to combine the stories because it's just too many of them. You know, I, I, I did this my whole life. So, you know, there it is. Well, it's nice to talk to you, Mick, Mickey Royal. And I uh, hope to read some of your books too. I'm very fascinated. Yeah, um, the, the Pimp Game Instructional Guide and the second Pimp Game are both on audio. They're at audible.com also. So you can drive in your car and listen to them. The rest of them are going up, you know, as we speak. So I, I see most people like to listen to them now. You know, they're available in ebook, audio, and paperback. But I see that most people really like to listen to them. And I would love for you to invite me back anytime. You know, I have tons of stories. Absolutely. But, oh, for you know. sure. Absolutely. Yes. This is for uh, youtube.com slash pilliter and as well pilliter.substack.com. I want to thank Mickey Royal and Cartrell Payne. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.